If you are interested in marketing on Pinterest to grow your teacher author business, then this video is for you. We have Pinterest marketing expert, Chelsea Hall here, and she is going to be sharing all the details from if Pinterest is not working for you, probably why it's not working for you and things that you can do to help remedy that to sharing how Pinterest is absolutely not dead. And that she has clients who are getting 30,000 plus clicks a month, directing traffic to their website and to TPT. And that is super, super exciting. I have to admit that Pinterest doesn't work for me. It hasn't worked for me in a very long time. I gave up on Pinterest, in fact, quite a while ago as they were making a lot of shifts and changes in Pinterest. But throughout the course of this conversation, Chelsea actually had me interested in Pinterest marketing, which if you've kind of been into my circle for a while, you know that that is saying a lot. So I want you guys to meet Chelsea. Hey, Chelsea, how are you? I'm good, Lauren. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, I am so, so excited to chat Pinterest with you. But before we get started on Pinterest, can you just tell us a little bit about you and your business and how you got started helping teachers pay teacher sellers, whether or not you sell on TPT? Tell us all the information. Yeah, so I'm Chelsea Hall. I'm the owner of Chelsea Hall Social. I'm a former first grade teacher. I was in the classroom for eight years and I left once I was pregnant with my first daughter and started getting that itch of this isn't going to work. This is some, something's going to have to change. And then I had my daughter five months in. I finally took a leap of faith and learned all about freelancing. I niched down quickly into Pinterest. And to be quite honest, I tried to escape the teacher world completely, but I got sucked back in really quick because I just know teachers. I know what people are going through. I knew the keywords. And so I kept saying to myself, like, why are you trying to run from this niche when it's like where your heart is at? So I quickly started working with teacher sellers. And that is pretty much 95% of my who my clients are and who I work with. And so I am going on two and a half years of business at this point. And I haven't looked back and I will never return to the classroom because I still have a foot in the classroom, so to speak, but I never see myself going back since had my second daughter and it just doesn't align with my family and what we need from how we envision our lifestyle moving forward. But let's talk about Pinterest because I'm not gonna say that I publicly bash Pinterest. I'm not a Pinterest basher. I'm not a hater on Pinterest necessarily but it's something that whenever I started with Pinterest, and I think a lot of TPT sellers have had similar experiences as I have. I started TPT in 2016, and then probably in 2018, I started running Pinterest ads. They were super successful. Mm -hmm. It was easy. It was fun. We were doing pinning parties. Pinterest was great, you know? And then all of a sudden they changed to like one tap ads and I just never mastered it. And I was like, you know what? Too much was changing. And I was like, I give up on Pinterest. And that was how I was. But I know that Pinterest is still working for some people. Okay. Can you talk about how Pinterest is not dead? Yeah. I mean, I fully hear you and I get that the changes have been massive since the time that you came to the platform. I mean, all of these platforms have changed significantly over the years, right? I don't want Pinterest to feel like that hard burden. What am I doing? I'm putting all of this effort into it and I'm getting nothing out of it because it's not rocket science, but it's complex. It's different than how these social platforms work because it's a search engine. It works different. It's in line with Google and in line with YouTube and the search functions are very different than over in the world of Instagram and TikTok, which it feels easier because I mean, even coming into like the freelancing spaces online world, I came into it and I actually tried social media managing Instagram accounts because I was like, I, I post cute pictures of my baby. Like how hard is that? And it's, and it just feels natural. I think for people, whereas like Pinterest, it's a marketing tool, not that all the other ones aren't, but it's a tool that you have to really learn to your question of Pinterest being dead. No, it's not dead, but it's not what it used to be. So I think the biggest thing is the mindset for Pinterest and mm -hmm. flipping your mindset as far as like Pinterest is not going to work. And I'm very open about this. If you are driving the majority of your traffic to your store, you're going to fall flat on your face. To be quite honest, you can count on your fingers worth of pins to your store and really leaning into sending the majority of your traffic to your website, primarily to long form content. So your blogs or your podcast and having your show notes serves as like a long form blog post, so to speak, and driving your traffic there and then soft selling your products, your 
freebies within those blog posts. And that's where you're going to get a cold lead because it's, it's top of funnel. But somebody reading a blog post, understanding how that product works, how something they can see it in their classroom, they're going to be a hotter lead. And when they get on your email list, they're going to be somebody that like actually actively buys from you. Now, I know this isn't probably the answer like that a lot of your teacher seller audience wants to hear like, well, Chelsea, I just want to send traffic to my products. I want them to buy. Like, that's the point. That's why I'm a teacher seller. I want people to buy my product. But Pinterest doesn't work that way. So you have to open your mind to the fact that it is a longer customer journey. However, that's what works right now on Pinterest. So you have to be open to the fact that if you're going to get on Pinterest, you have to be willing to create long form content. You have to have a blog. You have to have a website for them to land on. And slowly but surely, I'm encouraging people to have a website shop. I still am not seeing like the benefit fully of driving pins directly to your shop, but slowly but surely we're getting more click. I think the Pinterest like algorithm is figuring out what these website shops look like. So I have two teacher sellers that they also sell on Etsy. Same thing. If we ever create pins that go to Etsy, they fall flat on their face because it's a third party that Pinterest just basically shuts down at this point. So it's not that Pinterest is dead. It's just different. So you have to rework that. Like if you're going to be on Pinterest, you have to know that it's a longer game and that you're not creating a pin, sending it to your store and people are buying one Pinterest isn't serving those type of pins. And two people are more likely to buy once they're like immersed within your content, your long form content, and they really see it and get it. And again, it's just reframing the thought of people are going to Pinterest to find a solution to their problem. Like I'm going to teachers pay teachers because I need a quick morning work like activity because I am a stressed out mom and I haven't had time to prep anything. I know I can just type in morning work. Whereas I might be going to look for more of a new approach to my morning routine with my first graders. I'm struggling to get them to attend. I don't like doing morning work worksheets. What's a new morning routine that I can instill? I type that in morning routine or morning work. And then I find blog posts that give me ideas like, okay, now I can start my morning with this. And then it goes into this. And then I do a morning meeting and then I do this. And then I'm picking and choosing and, and clicking through to those links. And then I might be buying or adding them to my wish list or what have you over on TPT it's different. Okay. I think that that's an incredible mindset shift. And I've heard it said before about Pinterest that like they're wanting to curate inspiration and ideas. And so if you're creating content that inspires or gives ideas to people like those kind of things, that's the type of content that you have to create. Right. And so Mm -hmm. I think for people like me, it's really important for me to hear, okay, in order for this to be worthwhile, you have to be creating long form content, right? And so I don't do blogging. But here's my here's my follow up question to this, because I do have intentions of doing YouTube. Have you seen any success with driving traffic to YouTube? Or do they shut that down as well? So it's again, it's not as great. But what I would encourage you to do is taking your podcast, taking your YouTube videos. So I have a client right now that is wildly successful with taking her YouTube videos, putting it in a blog, having it live on her website. I create like five pins that go to that blog because it's it's literally like her video, a few notes. Yeah. And like the pins that we send to the blog, like take off like mad. And then I'll create like two that go to the YouTube and the same topic, same like keywords that we're targeting, but the second you send them to your your website, boom, they're off. The second you send them to YouTube, they just, they don't do as well. And so for you, if you're listening to me say this and you're like, okay, I, I don't have the time to turn those into a blog. I don't have the time. Then sit with that and be okay that like Pinterest truly isn't for you. But I'd rather give you like the reality of what's working than have you continuously just pin. And, and I have clients that we create pins for their TPT products, but that that's not our focus. That is like, we might be creating the majority going to their, you know, we have like landing pages within their website that like those are serving as their lead magnets. That's another way to grow their email list and what have you. And then we have a few going to their actual products, but so much time and effort to that. when we know that's not going to work as well as sending traffic to, to the website. Mm-hmm. That's just like, again, like the, the mindset, I guess, surrounding yeah. it. I love that because it allows even like me and anybody who's listening to kind of formulate a long-term game plan where I know like, okay, Pinterest can work for me. 
if my goal is to create YouTube content, then what I could do is I could create the YouTube content. And then when I get to a place where I'm ready to hire that out, I can have someone take those videos, put them on a website like you're talking about, write a short little description and then send the pins there, right? So it kind yep. of allows us to kind of create a long-term game plan if Pinterest is something that we want to pursue in the future. So let's talk about this for a second, because if somebody's listening, they're like, I don't have a website. This is a lot of pieces to the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about getting that website up and running and starting that blog. Do you recommend that they start creating those pins right away to send traffic to each blog as they do the blog post? Or do you recommend like maybe getting a certain number of blog posts up before you start driving traffic? Where should they focus their energy in the very beginning? Okay. So let's say it's, March, 2023, right? Throughout the month of March, I would set up your Pinterest account where you are creating your boards, you're creating your profile, you're figuring out your keywords, you're doing the foundational things that really matter most. Those things have not changed since the, the start of time of Pinterest. Like the foundational part of keywords has not changed. So like those you can set up simultaneously while you're setting up your website, I would recommend having four to six blogs ready to rock and roll before you do any pinning or else you're always going to feel like you're drowning and you're swimming backwards because like you're not going to get ahead of the game. And there's so much that you're doing. You're trying to grow your email list. You're trying to write the blogs, make your products, make, you know, send emails to your email list. But the beautiful thing about Pinterest is you are creating content that lives on your website that you are then creating pins for to drive traffic to your website. You're taking what already exists and you're getting people to get to those places. Think about it as like more of a holistic approach of like, okay, now I'm going to drive traffic to my YouTube a little bit and a little bit to my PPT store and a, and a lot of it to my blog <laughs> and to these lead magnets that exist on my website. Let's say you have a seasoned blog and you have like a backlog of 50 blogs and you've never done anything with, that's a Pinterest party. You can go back and create pins for all of that content. It's not like you're creating new content, you're creating new pins for content that's already in your ecosystem. The other thing that you can do if you don't have a lot of content is there are idea pins, which have been kind of in the Pinterest world for about two years now. Pinterest leaned very heavily into them for a while and they were taking off like crazy. They're taking a step back. So, but all that to say like idea pins are kind of a mix between reels and stories. Again, meant to educate and inspire. So if you're writing a blog post, like 10 classroom management ideas for back to school, you can repurpose that into an idea pin of like three classroom management hacks to get the school year started. So you're not giving away the whole blog, but you're just giving a little tease that like, it's a quick one for a teacher that they not, might not be thinking about. So you're repurposing content take those reels and get them on Pinterest as long as they fit the Pinterest audience. Because again, people on Pinterest want solutions to their problems. People over on Instagram, they're filling time and they're just there for, they're different, there for different reasons. Okay. So I have a couple of small follow-up questions for you. First, I want to go back to something that you said earlier, because I'm afraid I'm going to forget. And I genuinely want to know the answer to this myself, even if nobody else does. You were saying that some of your clients will create pins and you'll direct them to their landing pages for their email opt-ins. So my first question is the landing page on their website, number one, or is it like in, you know, ConvertKit or Flowdesk or something? And then the follow-up question is, does Pinterest censor that traffic a little bit? Like, can they tell that it's an opt-in? Great questions. So if it lives on your website, like you created a page within like your show it WordPress, what have you, Pinterest sees that as like going to your claim domain. If it's a form you've created on ConvertKit, they see that more like a third party, but it's not viewed as the same as like YouTube. They actually favor it. Like looking at a tier, they favor a website first, then like an opt-in and then like those third-party platforms fall underneath that. But driving traffic, like that's like one of the best ways to grow your email list is through Pinterest. Because like, let's say you have five lead magnets every few months, create new pins, create new pins, create new pins and, and spin them. So hit different pain points like chatty class, question mark, try these five classroom management tips, how to 
control of your chatty class, like switching up how you're wording things because like it might catch them in different ways, depending on how you're wording things on your pen. Okay. So this is all really good information. Let's get into the practicalities of it. We're first going to talk about what mistakes do you see people making when they're going, okay, I tried making pins for my opt-in or I tried making pins for my blog or whatever. Nothing's working. Nothing's taking off. When they're saying these things, are there some commonalities that you're finding with what they're doing and what's not working? Yeah. So first and foremost is having an optimized account overall. So Pinterest is an algorithm, it's a search engine. And so everything is based off of keywords and keywords that are Pinterest keywords, not like Google, like don't use keywords everywhere to find your keywords, like actually look at Pinterest to discover what people are searching for because they search differently. You want to lay that foundation that I was speaking to. So you want to have keywords in your profile name and your description. You want to have keywords in your board titles, your board descriptions. You want to have keywords in your pin titles, your pin descriptions your pen text overlay. So all of those places, if you're neglecting those, nobody's going to ever find your content because Pinterest isn't going to know how to index or serve the content that you're creating. So laying that foundation is one mistake that I see often is people just get so eager and excited. They just start pinning, but they don't have that backbone. Also make sure to claim your website. Pinterest is going to appreciate that and then you'll be able to track your analytics. The next thing is people, as we've spoken to, is only sending traffic to TPT, right? They're only sending traffic to TPT and they're like, this is falling flat and it will fall flat unless you're diversifying where you are sending your pins to. The other thing is not looking at your analytics, not looking at like what's working, what's not working, not thinking about, like I said, like those pain points of what teachers are struggling with. Creating busy pins is something that I see a lot of teacher sellers do because on TPT, those do really well. The busyness, the like, look at what you get and you get this and this and this. And so I think I'll, I, and in conversation with teacher sellers is they're like, but I want to make sure they see everything. And I want them to see that they're getting all these things. And honestly, some of the best pins are the ones that have a really nice title and like just a Canva stock photo of a classroom, like of a, just something basic because people scroll past the busyness. They like get overwhelmed by that. So it's just like almost dumbing down your pins, using your branding and showing up consistently. Pinterest is a long game, just committing to it and knowing that like, it's something that you have to establish what's going to be sustainable for you and then stick with that rather than like one month you're doing 30 pins, the next you're doing 45, the next you're doing five, the next you're doing 10. Pinterest can be like, what the heck? They can't trust you as an account, as a creator. And so they're not going to serve your content as well as somebody who's consistently pushing out that fresh content. They're begging for at this point. I think that's really important to note too, that the consistency is important because that's not something that I would have thought about. But I know that on some platforms like YouTube, YouTube is really big on consistency. Mm -hmm. Instagram, not so much. I say not so much, but like not nearly as much as YouTube, you know, I, right. but it's just two totally different platforms. So I think that that's really important to know that if you're going to do it, then you need to give it some time. Mm -hmm. And you're saying a year, which is, you know, a significant amount of time, but also what I'm hearing is this needs to be really strategic. This isn't something that's just like, I, I think there are so many old blog posts, old videos, old advice out there. That's just like, every time you make a product, create five pins and pin those and send the traffic to your TPT store. And what you're saying is that kind of strategy is not going to give you results. Pinterest is a serious platform. And if you do things casually, you're not going to get any traffic. Can we talk about the kind of success that you've seen clients experience with Pinterest? Yeah, I mean, it's a range. So it's going to be very different from somebody that's starting today versus somebody that's been on the platform since the start of time, right? So I will say seasoned accounts, like you had decent traffic, like those accounts, if I take them over, they take off much quicker because Pinterest is like, oh, you, you've been in this world for a while, like you've been doing this. New accounts are much slower to go, but Pinterest always says to expect two to 5% growth month over month, expecting ebbs and flows. All niches, pretty much, unless you're, you're Christmas and holiday heavy, like November, December is just a hot mess on Pinterest. It's just a slow time. And then like end of April, May, June, another like, ooh, like, Sometimes I'm like, oh man, doing these analytics reports, I'm like, well, these are rough. But then all of a sudden, July, July, August, September, and you're like, 
holy moly, the amount of traffic that is coming from Pinterest to their clients' websites is insane. So I have access to all clients' backend, like Google Analytics. So I can see like their Pinterest, their Instagram, their Facebook, their YouTube, like all of the things. And pretty much all of them, Pinterest is number one at this point. And so like, I'll get on strategy calls with clients and they're like, well, I'm doing Instagram. I need to be doing Instagram. And I'm like, well, let's look at like where your numbers are at. And Pinterest is like right there. So I'm like, if you put any skin in the game on Pinterest, that is quickly going to jump up the second you put love into it. And then over six or seven months, they're like, oh my gosh, like, I wish I was doing this sooner. All that to say, like, I have clients that like, I took over an account two years ago, they started at 15 min pins a month, they're now at 4000 a month. So that's drastically more than the two to 5% growth. I have other clients where one month it's 7,000 outbound clicks. The next it's 14,000. The next it's like 25,000. The next it's 30,000. And then it bounces back down to 5,000. It's all seasonal ebbs and flows. But instead of me looking at it as like, oh my God, it's up, it's up, it's up. And then it's down, it's down. I know that these are normal things and that things will upswing again. And so like, I don't panic because I see that. And so like a big piece of advice is to track, go back in the last six months, the last year and look at your outbound clicks, your saves, which are two of the biggest pieces of analytics that I would track and see like, what does it look like from January all the way through to January? If you've been on the platform for that long and see like, oh, I guess that isn't that bad. Or, oh, I did have two to 5% growth. And so like, that's to be expected. I should be seeing that. Would you go out on a limb and say that if you don't have a blog and you don't have a website or any form of long form content that just wait to do Pinterest and spend your time elsewhere? Would you say that? If you are doing it, like I would not hire a Pinterest manager if you are just sending traffic to there because you're not gonna see as big of a return on your investment. I don't wanna sit here and say that you're not gonna see any traffic. You're just not gonna see the, the traffic that like people say is possible for Pinterest. Mm. So you're gonna still get clicks and that's better than nothing. So it's still 100% worth it, but I wouldn't put the time and energy into hiring it out, I guess. Like, oh, I think that's really smart advice. I really like that. So let's talk about this. When we're talking about like actually pinning, you kind of mentioned idea pins. What should these pins look like? Like, what are idea pins and what should they feel like? What should I be showing in those? Yeah, so you want to approach idea pins in the sense that you're giving your audience that quick win. You're educating and inspiring. You want them to be something that makes them want to go learn more about you. So let's say March of Reading Month is coming up and you share five activities and then like they can go learn more to learn the other five activities that exist. You're giving a teacher quick wins of you can do this literacy center, math center. You can do this for morning work for March's reading month. You could do this and you could do that. So it's giving them like ideas, but it's not giving them everything about you or like what they would learn in like a blog. You're not sitting there on an idea pin though like with one of like a trending audio like you would see over on Instagram, like those funny things. Over on Pinterest, it's supposed to be something of how to, what not to do, five mistakes you might be making on Pinterest, how to end the day strong with your first graders, how to build parent-teacher relationships, five ways I mastered writing conferences with my second graders. So it's like, it's something where they feel like it was worth them watching where they get like consumed. And then the goal is for them to go to your profile, click on your website and go learn more about you. Or they might go like binge some of your static pins and then click through and then they're on your website even better. Yeah. Are we giving them a call to action in these idea pins? Are we saying, you know, go follow me on Pinterest or are we saying go visit my website for more information? Yes. Always a call to action. So your call to action can vary. So like I just did like a series of like a hundredth day idea pins recently. And so we just kept referring them, go follow my hundredth day board because we wanted them to go to the board to then get more ideas or it might be head over to my free download for the hundredth day and and then they can go grab it like when idea pins first came out they were like they were very against like adding a link to the like the idea pin description and they said that they were going to like not rank them as high and whatever at this point you can add a link 
into them. I haven't found them to like be clicked on any more than they would be if you had the link, not had the link, but having them follow is a great call to action. So idea pins are really for helping people find you and kind of brand guess. awareness. Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. Brand awareness. Exactly. And the pins themselves are for driving traffic. So the static pins are for driving traffic. Yep. So let's talk about the static pins. What is the ratio for static pins? Like we're going to start that basic. Two to three ratio. Two yes. to three. Okay. So that hasn't yep. changed. All right. Okay. Yes. No, no, no. So, so yeah. So if you go on Canva and you just type in like Pinterest templates, it will pull up like the, the blank template, the sizing that you would want. So that, and then nine by 16 for idea pins. So basically same size as, and, and what's nice is repurpose, use your TikToks, use your reels, but pick the TikToks and reels that are the teaching ones rather than like the cute trend of like, you know, everybody's doing the Rihanna from the Super Bowl, like that's not what we're putting on Pinterest. We are putting more of like the teaching part of like what somebody can take away from you and learn from you. That's awesome. And so for my static pins, you had kind of mentioned earlier, we're pitting, we're not making them busy. We're keeping them clean, simple. So yep. I'm assuming using like one image and then like some sort of text overlay. Are there any other general guidelines that one should follow if they're creating a static pin? Yeah. So over the, the text overlay, include a keyword even on that because like Pinterest, it reads it like the, the AI actually reads the pin so it can pick up on those keywords. Have your branding, have your brand colors, your brand fonts. So that way you're easily recognizable. Have your logo or website on there. See images, having product photography done. If you don't have somebody taking photos for you, do it yourself, but use like presets to make it look visually appealing. You can use Canva stock photos if you need to, but using your own product photography is, is always encouraged. I'm not going to say it's best, but it's encouraged when you have opportunities to add a call to action, like an actual button, like download the guide, grab your freebie, learn more, read more, listen in. Like if you were promoting your podcast or watch the video, watch the free tutorial, step-by-step -step guide. So adding some sort of call to action, not making it busy. And again, hitting those pain points or hitting those five tips to how, and then the next one is like how to, so you're like varying how you're like approaching the same, like it's, they're all going to the same URL, but you're diversifying what you're putting on each of the pin. I love that. Okay. So this has been incredibly valuable, Chelsea. So thank you so much for being here. And you're telling welcome. Us about how first, how Pinterest isn't dead and how there are a lot of people. I mean, you mentioned earlier, some people are seeing like 30,000 clicks in a month, which is just, just an, an incredible amount of traffic and would be life-changing for anybody. So I think that that's really important to know that there are people who are experiencing that kind of traffic coming from Pinterest, but then also all of the very practical advice for getting started on Pinterest and for knowing like, okay, I need to have a website or I need to have a blog and all of that kind of stuff, which is amazing. If a listener wants to connect with you, first of all, Chelsea's going to be at Teacher Seller Summit and she's going to be talking about Pinterest marketing. That's her whole session. So if you want to learn more about Pinterest marketing, one of the first things that you can do is get your ticket to Teacher Seller Summit, but we also want you to get in touch with Chelsea. So where can listeners find you if they want to learn more? Yeah. So head over to Instagram. I share a lot of Pinterest tips, of course, but a lot of just true entrepreneur mom life over at Chelsea Hall Social. So that's where I'm at on Instagram. My website is Chelsea Hall Social as well. Those are the two best places and my DMs are always open. Feel free to ask any questions that might come up based on this episode or, or anything that you're like wondering and seeing just what are like the latest trends or best practices for Pinterest. You can always reach out over there. Well, I am so excited to listen to your session myself at Teacher Seller Summit because you've got me interested in Pinterest now, which is something that I don't think that I thought I would say. <laughs> and so I think that they could, I'm just so glad that you came here and, and chatted with me today. We'll put the links to your website and your Instagram down inside of the description. And I encourage anyone who's listening to go and give her a follow. So thank you so much for being here, Chelsea. Thanks, Laura, for having me. If you want to learn more about Pinterest marketing, Chelsea actually has a free getting started on Pinterest guide. It is linked down inside of the show notes. I've also linked to her Instagram and her website where you can connect with her. And of course, she's going to be at Teacher Seller Summit talking all about Pinterest marketing and how to use Pinterest marketing inside of your TPT business. And you do not want to miss that. Make sure you get your ticket today. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it and subscribe. You can even turn on alerts by clicking the little bell icon so that you get alerted 
excited when I release a new video each and every week. So if you are in the business of growing your teacher author business, right here is where you want to be. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and I'm going to see you in the next video.